some monsters call to mind very specific images. Their iconic on-screen personas overshadow their earlier histories. I'm talking about Frankenstein and his creature, Dracula, the Invisible Man, the Wolfman, the Mummy. Why is this? Universal Pictures. These famous Universal monster faces inspired decades of Halloween costumes and make up a distinctive brand of horror that defined early Hollywood cinema. With strategic decisions in wardrobe and special effects, uniform marketing, innovative cinematography, and casting that turned everyday actors into stars, Universal Pictures forever changed the game for on-screen monsters. At the turn of the 20th century, early silent horror films were largely macabre European creations featuring ghosts, skeletons, and wizards set against gothic backdrops. The 1922 German film Nosferatu was a fitting fulfillment of the Eastern European vampire's legacy and the first horror film with an original score. But what is now considered to be the canonical period of horror cinema didn't come about until Universal emerged as a powerhouse motion picture studio. Founded in 1912, Universal Film Manufacturing Company initially saw critical and financial success, but like most of America struggled during the Great Depression. The solution to the studio's woes came in an unexpected form, monsters. Universal's 1930s business strategy started with a plan to make movies on as tight a budget as possible, and horror fit the bill nicely. The elements of gothic storytelling combined swimmingly with the low lighting and imaginative camera tricks that disguised budget-conscious sets. Unknown actors could be concealed behind creative makeup effects, and hiring veteran European crew members familiar with gothic work made adapting spooky stories for Hollywood easier. With the horrors of World War I and the Great Depression, America adopted isolationist policies alongside patriotism. The monstrous figure embodied outside threats to these modern constructions, literally entering the homes of families to tear them down from the inside. Other common themes in Universal's golden age of horror films included the mad scientist hell-bent on playing God, the crumbling ancestral home or castle, class tensions, failed marriages, and challenges to traditional gender roles, all amidst a gothic setting that alluded to the historical but evoked present-day fears. A clever way for a studio to appeal to what's already in the minds of the people. Universal's first venture into horror began in 1931 with the infamous undead bloodsucker himself, Dracula, an established character in folklore and literature. Both Dracula and Nosferatu predate Universal's version, but Universal's Dracula was the first to legally adapt Bram Stoker's famous text. After purchasing the rights to both the novel and theater adaptation of Dracula in 1929, studio executive Carl Lemley Jr. greenlit the film version with a few caveats. A tight budget, prioritization of elements from the stage play, and a short enough runtime to use in a double feature. Todd Browning was hired as director and Charles D. Hall was tapped for set design, but the studio still needed the star. While other more famous actors were considered, Bela Lugosi stood out as the logical choice. He had played Dracula on Broadway and he was cheap. And thank the fates for that. Lugosi's portrayal of the Count in Universal's makeup and wardrobe became the most influential visual portrayal of vampires to this day. The pale skin, dark slick back hair, aristocratic wardrobe, and infamous cape became the iconic depiction we frequently associate with Dracula. And even though many modern interpretations of vampires have moved past this portrayal, the countless imitations of the Universal brand, not to mention the Halloween costumes, made this vampire an icon. After the success of Dracula, Universal was thirsty for another home run. They offered prominent director James Whale a slew of different project concepts to choose from, and he went with another monster property, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Like Dracula before it, the movie's success hinged on the commercial appeal of the monster. 
Whale insisted on casting Boris Karloff, a noted but under-recognized character actor as the creature. The neck bolts, the exaggerated brow, and the suit were a notable departure from Mary Shelley's original creation. Yet the emotion that Shelley wrote into the character was still present thanks to Karloff. Universal's interpretation would define both the actor and Shelley's character into the 21st century. Take care, Herr Frankenstein, take care. And in the Frankenstein film's final iconic face-off between Henry and his creature, Universal continued to use innovative cinematography as a hallmark of the genre when the two gaze at each other through the spinning wheel of the windmill, the slats broken revelation of their faces mimicking a film projector and its precursor, the zoetrope. Frankenstein was the first movie promoted by a studio as a horror picture, and that decision was not met without resistance, primarily from Catholic and conservative leaders. Critics condemned a controversial hanging scene and some of the film's dialogue as heretical. Trying to address these concerns, Universal included a unique prologue to the feature, condemning Frankenstein's actions and warning the audience of what they will see. We are about to unfold the story of Frankenstein a man of science who sought to create a man after his own image without reckoning upon God. Still, some newspapers refused to publish ads for the film and censors demanded edits. But the saying, any publicity is good publicity, worked here. Made for less than $300,000, Frankenstein outperformed Dracula, grossing $12 million domestically. And... Universal had another successful monster. In 1932, Universal drew inspiration from recent events, the discovery of the tomb of King Tutankhamun. His shrunken, mummified corpse captured the world's attention, as did the rumored accompanying curse. The mummy told a tale of forbidden love using the now-recognizable Boris Karloff as the titular character. With a powerful score and clever shots of miniature sets, viewers were transported to an exotic interpretation of Egypt that paid homage to the undercurrent of magic that fueled so many of film's earliest Gothic stories. Like its universal precursors, The Mummy's cinematic creativity significantly contributed to its historical permanence. Pioneering cameraman Karl Papa Frund moved the camera in ways previously unseen. He freed the camera from the typical static tripod strapping it to his chest for resting angles and placing it on a crane for expansive frames. In 1934, Hollywood instituted the self-imposed Hayes Code, responding to industry scandals of the 1920s and increasingly boundary-challenging films. These censorship guidelines aimed to curtail anything that didn't depict the correct standards of life, as defined by the rich men in charge at the time. As a result, horror didn't disappear on screen, but became a bit more subdued. Universal, in spite of the Hayes Code, however, still marketed their films as shocking, meant to astound and horrify, which continued to draw in audiences. Universal went on to add The Invisible Man and The Werewolf of London to their horror lineup, bringing striking and memorable special effects to the screen, not to mention two more iconic monsters. The monster genre couldn't solve all of Universal's financial struggles. Burdened with debt, Universal was bought out by the Standard Capital Bank in 1936, and the existing studio heads were canned. New execs cut budgets further, prioritizing musicals and halting production on new horror content, leading to an exciting development, the introduction of the horror sequel. Eager to capitalize on their earlier successes in the genre, Universal produced a whole host of sequels, Bride of Frankenstein, Dracula's Daughter, Son of Frankenstein, The Invisible Man Returns, The Mummy's Hand, The Mummy's Tomb, and Son of Dracula. These burgeoning franchises were financially strategic and further established Universal's looming presence in horror cinema. Using a now-established cast and crew from makeup artists to set designers, the visual style of the Universal horror film stayed consistent and immediately recognizable. Repeated visual and technical cues like violent storms, operating room or lab sets, off-screen female screams, large ancestral homes, heavy use of shadows, and creative cinematic framework solidified the style. Also in the 1940s, Universal introduced back-to-back -back crossover films to the industry. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, House of Frankenstein, and House of Dracula. 
These in-universe collaborations put the recognizable figures of Frankenstein's creature, Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mad Doctor, and the Hunchback Assistant together on screen, like an Avengers-style universe with fewer rules and no shared history. In the years following the conclusion of World War II, moviegoing audiences seemed to lose their appetite for monster movies. Perhaps needing a break from violence and horror in general, they opted for more uplifting content at the box office. The monster movies that were made during this period backed away from horror elements and leaned into the comedic potential of the genre. In the 1950s, while Universal Studios, now Universal International, continued to produce horror films, they prioritized science fiction in response to world events and audiences shifting favor. While the quality of these films is debated, there is little denying that the decade contributed at least one more unique and iconic Universal monster. The Creature from the Black Lagoon. They marketed the film as the strangest science fiction thriller of them all, hoping to attract audiences enthralled with the newly popular genre and who were comfortable with monster stories from the previous two decades. This monster isn't based so much on existing lore, but does rely on a familiar monster-as-human trope. Set in the Amazon, the half-fish, half-human monster struggles with very human feelings of isolation and loneliness. Called the Gill Man, the notable and beautifully designed character suit and sophisticated makeup, under the direction of noted actress and special effects artist Millicent Patrick, stand up as a hallmark of Universal's monsters. The film was also notable for its underwater photography, not common for the time. It's not only a story that makes a monster iconic. All the creators who contributed to Universal's classic monsters did so with a specific intention. The writers, actors, directors, cinematographers, marketing executives, special effects teams, and costuming departments. They form the beating or undead heart of these silver screen interpretations. I can't help but wonder if the commercial and critical failure of some of the reboot attempts is because they strayed too far from the original Universal monster formula. Take 2017's The Mummy. Big name A-list Hollywood actors, huge budgets, too heavy a reliance on digital special effects, and an obvious eye on franchise tie-ins. It neglected to honor the monster and its meaning. In my opinion, the magic of the original films comes from the forced creativity necessary of a smaller budget, the gothic themes, and letting the monster and its story sell the film. The Invisible Man came closer to this formula. With a $7 million budget, a fraction of the mummies, it uses the absence of the monster's form, literally, in favor of atmospheric tension and some pretty horrifying practical effects. Universal's monsters pushed back against societal norms, often embracing the taboos that rigidly defined conventional American social structures of family, patriarchy, gender, and class. While the golden age of Universal Classic Monsters is long gone, its legacy has become monstrous itself. Enduring, frightening, and always there to scare our imaginations into action. Ahoy, matey! The newest show over on PBS Origins will take you on an enlightening voyage through the pirate history you've been missing. Rogue history unravels historical myths, unearths lost narratives, and champions unsung heroes. It's the pirate history you were never told. Hit the link in the description and explore it now. Yeah, right in my Rolling yeah. and action. Oh no! Oh god. <laughs> <Action>. <laughs> I'm terrible. No. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs>